The coastal mountains of California, an environment teeming with life. And all of it is sustained by vast stretches of shrubs and small trees. Dozens of different kinds of evergreens that scientists call chaparral. They've been here for millions of years, but within decades, many of these species could be gone because of an unprecedented surge in wildfires. It's hard for seeds to survive this kind of heating. This scientist is asking, what price would we pay if chaparral disappears? We're starting to push ecosystems outside of these realms of things that they've experienced in the past. A lot of these things that we've taken for granted forever, we can't take for granted any longer. And we ignore that at our peril. OK, we're going to work right here. In the mountains of California's Coast Range, about 70 miles from San Francisco, ecologist Hugh Safford and four of his students are beginning another day of research. They're gathering evidence about the threat that is facing chaparral. OK, yeah, so you guys, this is chemise, adenostoma fasciculatum. It's in the rose family. There was a fire here eight months ago. The team is checking to see how the plants are doing now. Here, this didn't burn quite so hot, and you can see that it's a sort of flaky bark with a little bit of red undertones under it. We know from our historical data sources that chaparral does really well if it only sees a fire about every 30 to 100 years. They'll recover very quickly. In five, six, seven, eight years, you'll have nearly the same looking stand that you had before fire. But the chaparral here has had to cope with four big fires in just six years. Scientists worry that many chaparral species can't survive such frequent burning. And when these plants die off, the consequences ripple through nature. Many species of animals will lose the habitat they depend on. And though we may not realize it, people rely on chaparral, too. When it rains, the plant's leaves and branches deflect water from the mountain soil. Their roots help to hold the soil in place. But without chaparral, during rainstorms, soil starts flowing downhill, resulting in mudslides. It's a huge mess here on Highway 38. Farther to the left is where we had some of that really severe burn from the El Dorado fires. We have this hillside behind us that has this black burn scar. I mean, we've had rain before, lots of rain before, no problem, it gets absorbed into the soil. But with no vegetation to hold it, then this happened. So to help reduce the damage done by the loss of chaparral, Hugh wants to find out which species are likely to survive frequent fires and which ones aren't. Now we're going in to look at what the impacts are across a whole range of different fire frequencies. We're looking at areas that have burned no times, areas that have burned one time, and areas that have burned twice, and thrice, and four times, and five times, and six times in the course of the last 20 or 30 years. So we'll be doing what we call plot sampling. In each of those plots, we're counting all the species that we see. We're also measuring whether shrubs survived or died during the fire. And if they survived, how tall are their re-sprouts? Oh, so cool. This is called Melica. This is so Melica. what we're trying to develop is some level of predictability as to how many fires can we have in what period of time and still think that we can regenerate chaparral on the site where they can actually survive. What makes Hughes' work so timely and urgent is that year after year, the fire problem keeps getting worse. 
The state of California is on fire. Firefighters battle one of the largest fires in state history. Hundreds of wildfires burning at once have ravaged more than 1,200 square miles this week. In total, the area burning is larger than the entire state of Rhode Island. California is just one of many places in the world where wildfires have become bigger and more frequent, in large part because of climate change. So what happened here was it burned a lot hotter. Hotter summers and prolonged droughts have been making plants drier and more combustible. But Hugh and many other scientists say that when it comes to the mountains and forests in the western U.S., there's another cause that's just as important. A fundamental misunderstanding of the role of fire in nature that's deeply rooted in American history. For centuries, the Native Americans who inhabited the West understood that intermittent wildfires, sparked by lightning, are a normal occurrence. They foster the natural cycle of decay and regrowth. So they set intentional fires to influence that cycle for their own benefit. By burning plant species, for example, that compete with oak trees, the source of the acorns that were a staple food for many Western tribes. But the European Americans who seized control of the West forced the Native Americans off their land, putting an end to intentional burning. The federal government, which managed huge swaths of Western land, saw fires only as destructive. For more than a century, it was national policy to try to prevent or quickly extinguish all forest fires, in part to protect the profitable logging industry, and also to safeguard the homes of the many new settlers in the West. So trees and vegetation that in past centuries would have periodically burned no longer did. The amount of combustible fuel in the forests just kept on growing, setting the stage for the rash of huge wildfires we see today. The largest single wildfire in California history on the doorstep of more historic small towns. I think it's the classic short-sightedness. Sometimes you might assume that people might actually understand the long-term implications. In this case, no one even thought about them. But eventually, we did learn from the past. Today, Native American tribes like the Karuk in California have revived the practice of intentional burning. I hope to see us manage the lands more with fire. Like that's, that's the ultimate goal, is to go back to how it's been done for generations, bring good fire back. It's not going to stop it, but it'll help prevent the catastrophic fires that have been going on. And the value of the Native Americans' ancient practice is now recognized by the U.S. Forest Service, which is conducting its own controlled burns in different parts of the country. While these efforts can reduce some of the fire risk that's built up in our forests, they're nowhere near enough to bring an end to the wildfire crisis, which in the West, scientists predict, will grow steadily worse. So these ones here are the ones that you sampled up on top of the roof? Mm -hmm. We'll be measuring these plots for at least three years, and all of this will give us some predictability as to what that chaparral will look like in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Hugh hopes that a better understanding of which plants are not surviving will help forest managers to identify the species that most urgently need to be replanted. I mean, I'm sure the world could live without chaparral. It's a building block. It's like you pull one brick out of a building, it's still there. But when you pull a bunch of them out, it's not there any longer. A lot of these questions about our ability to sustain ecosystems into the future under all of these different components of global change is going to depend to a great extent on what we learn in places like California. 
We care a lot about the world, the planet, humans' role in it. And I feel as if that we can do things that we can be proud of, that we can say to ourselves that we left the Earth a slightly better place than we showed up. And that's what drives me.